All right, would you all grab your Bibles real quick? We're going to, to continue. We started last week with, with good, goodness. And by all estimation, last Sunday's message was good. It was good. I, um, I, love, I love the depth of these words that may seem simple at face value, but man, it is just, it's so rich with content. Here's the question for today as you prepare your heart to, to listen to the word this morning. How have you made light of God's kindness toward others? Another way of wording that might look like this, and this kind of, it's a little bit more harsh. How have you despised God's kindness toward others? How have you made light or how have you despised God's kindness toward others? That is the question that you can be mulling over and reflecting back to um, throughout the message this morning. And so we've already prayed several times this morning. I think we're ready for the word. Are you all ready for the word? Okay. The reason why we're doing these values is for two purposes. One, to remind, to be a perpetual reminder, and also to be a perpetual inspiration. I'm not talking about inspiration like the posters that you would read at a dentist's office, like the eagle flies higher than it. I'm not talking about that kind of inspiration. I'm talking about what has God called us to, and we need that constantly. If we didn't, then Jesus never would have instructed us to observe communion. We need the reminder, and we need that being compelled to live the way that God wants us to live. And so what we have covered so far I guess before we talk about what we've covered so far, the other reason that I want to get it instilled in your heart and your mind is the other reason why we're going through these values at a, at a slow pace or a slow-ish pace is so that they get in our heart because we want to be able to reproduce ourselves. You cannot reproduce what you can't define. And so if you know that you have Jesus in your heart, but you don't know how to define Jesus in your life in Christ, chances are you're not going to be able to articulate a life in Christ to someone else. So do the homework, put the time in to, to wrap words to define who Jesus is and how he has revealed himself to you. Because if you can't define it, you're not going to reproduce it. By the way, the expectation is that you would reveal the life and the light of Christ to others so that his life and light would be seen in them and embraced by them. So, so far, what we have covered, where do we start? I'm not going to tell you because I know what it is and I want to see how well y'all been listening, but what was week one and two? God's word. I got like three people right up here. How about the rest of y'all? What was week one and two? God's word. Are y'all sure? Okay, what was week one and two? God's word. Okay. It's not like classroom or anything. I just, just hope we'd be more excited about the word. That's all. All right. What was week three? Intentional presence. My takeaway that is, is kind of, ha it has like this slow tweaking process to my life is three words that are wrapped around intent or intentionality. Purpose, design, and action. And if we flip that script and put God in there, God acts according to the design of his purpose. And so for me, what that means is if I don't take the time to define a purpose and map out a design, I'm not going to know how to act. I'm not going to know what actions to take. And this, is, this goes from really basic things to okay, I know I've got an early morning, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to purpose in myself to go to bed earlier so that I can wake up a few moments earlier so that I can have time in the Word. That's my purpose, design, and action. If you don't do those things, you won't do those things. If you don't, you won't. And then last week, we talked about goodness. Goodness. From cover to cover, beginning to end, the first chapter to the last two chapters of the Bible are all slathered in God's goodness. We have to start there and end there because if we start and end in the middle of the story, we have a skewed view of ourselves and a skewed view of God. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Everything that God does is good. 
even his judgments. That's another time, another message for another time. So we have two parts of this word, or this, this value, it's goodness and kindness. What's interesting when you do a word study is goodness, when you unpack that word and everything that it means, I don't recall finding the word kindness in it. However, in the word study for kindness, goodness is the first word that you land on. And so they, oh, there is some overlap to goodness and kindness. I would word it this way, that goodness shows the nature of God. Kindness shows us the compassion of God. So out of God's nature of goodness, we see his actions of kindness. And so goodness is the nature. Kindness is the action. His, his name and actions and plans and mercies All of it is good. He is totally and completely good. And so what I didn't do last Sunday is I didn't take time to show how bad the world is to show God's goodness. Because we don't need to. We can just see his goodness for what it is. So that's why I didn't, I had this whole page mapped out of like, this is how bad we are. This is what badness looks like in comparison to goodness. And and God just didn't allow me to do that because his goodness speaks for itself. However, in the conversation of kindness, we only see his kindness by looking at unkindness. That's the only way we can see it. How do, you, how do you know kindness unless there's an opportunity to show it? Right? You can say you're a kind person all you want, but until you meet or have a section in, in the road of your life where it calls forth a, a kind response or an opportunity for a kind response, then you're just wishfully thinking, but you've not had anything happen in your life that challenges that truth that you're saying. I would say if you live any longer than five years old, you know that you are presented with an opportunity of whether to be kind or not. I mean, it goes back to the basic things of like sharing toys with your sibling. Unless you're an only child, then I don't know what the challenge would be at home. But we are all presented with the opportunity of whether to be kind or not. So... Romans, chapter, or Romans 1 and 2 help us understand the scope of human depravity and God's kindness. We're not going to read all of chapter 1, but Paul is so masterful in his writing because he sets up everybody. You ever read material where you're like, okay, I got, I got a handle on this? I know where they're going, and then you keep reading, and they just flip everything on you and be like, oh, I did not see that. I did not expect that, and that happens to me all the time just because uh, I'm slow to the scene, and anyways, um, Paul does that in this letter to the Romans. Early on, he does it, where he's just kind of buttering these people up, and he's like, man, um, here's the reality. This is, this is the purpose that I've been called to, that God sent me for, and, and this is what I'm doing. And, and then he just goes right into talking about just how dysfunctional and broken people are, particularly non-Jews. Can you believe how jacked up they are, how messed up they are? And he's saying that everybody, he walks them through this process where Everybody is on the same playing field, though. He talks about how broken they are, but at the same time, he's saying, listen, none of us are without excuse. None of us have an excuse to point a finger and say God doesn't exist. He says, even through creation... If, if a truly humble heart takes an honest, good look at creation, we will come to the conclusion that there was an intelligent designer behind all of this. 
the seasons and the systems and the, there's micro seasons and macro seasons and there's all of these different kinds of things that play into why the world is the way that it is and these, this unique environment that is unparalleled in all of the universe. There's no other planet in all of the history of searching for other planets that can be compared to Earth. They didn't know that in the Bible times because they couldn't see that far. But as time has gone on, there's more and more proof of the uniqueness of this place that we live, and yet we, there's the possibility to treat it as, hmm, it's just happened. And I don't need to go on my little soapbox on what I think about different theories. There's no theory. God made everything. I'm convinced. There's too much purpose behind everything for it to be accidental. I learned in science class in the seventh grade, I learned science class in seventh grade that wolves came from dolphins. They showed the progressive picture. I was like, Indiana, just stick with raising corn, okay? Just like, <laughs> stay in your lane. But with this, all that's in front of them, all that's in front of all creation, mankind, humankind, still comes to this place where they say, I see what's been created, but I like what I can create better. I, I think my wisdom is better. My truth is truer. This is God. Hashtag golden calf. Hashtag false gods. Like, whatever you can get your hands on, that's what we will cause to be God. My wallet is my God. My purpose and significance, my popularity, all of my, my attainments, that's my God because it's tangible. And it's, it has the appearance of being more fulfilling than God. See, the problem with that, like, like Jesus is the, the, the problematic one for all of that because Jesus came here. A.D., B.C. were created around him, right? So he's at the center, the epicenter of everything. So what's crazy and what immediately reveals God's kindness is that God doesn't combat our cravings. God doesn't fight against our desire to create other gods. What he does is he lets it play out. Do you know what that's called? That's called his kindness. Strange kindness, right? Well, listen to what Paul, Paul spells this out in Romans at the end of chapter uh, one of Romans. He says these things. When men wanted to, when, when humankind wanted to create for themselves a God, this is what he says in verse 26. This is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. And they, they exchanged natural relationships. And particularly, I think we've got an old enough crowd in here, people traded natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, both men and women. And so they committed what was shameful to, with one another. God said, you, you want to go down this lane of fabricating a, a God and an existence that you think is better than my design? Go for it. And it's amazing how quick, watch, watch this, immediately when people are detached from God, their understanding of relational intimacy is immediately, immediately skewed. People who are distant from God don't have, an tr don't have a true understanding of what intimacy is. They can't. It's always going to be a twisted version of intimacy. Two times in, in, at the end of chapter 1 where he says, God delivered them over. That was in verse 26, and the second one is in verse 28. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God... God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. 
They didn't think it worthwhile to acknowledge God. I've got better things to do. I've got better things. I've got a better God that I'm working on and creating here. I don't need to acknowledge you. I'm going to acknowledge what's tangible and what I can wrap my hands around. And because of that, because they didn't acknowledge God, God delivered them over. He didn't give them the ability. He just gave them permission. You want to run down that lane? I'll let you run down that lane. Let's see how far you go down that road before you find yourself in a state of hopelessness and brokenness. Now, Paul is still setting the stage. The Jews think that it's all about everybody else. Like, you're right. They are behaving. They are behaving that way. They are the broken ones. They are the God creators. They are the ones that are sexually promiscuous and skewed and messed up. They are the ones. And so I could imagine them listening or reading this letter and be like, he is unloading on the Gentiles. This is so good. Then he writes chapter 2. Therefore, anyone who judges is without excuse. Ho- uh, hold up. You, you remember like two seconds ago when I was like, yeah, that's about them. That statement is so judgmental, right? I would imagine they're probably like, oh man, I messed up. I got too excited too quick. I jumped ahead of the scene here. If Paul was from the south, he'd say, therefore, all y'all that judge, y'all don't have a leg to stand on. Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge, for when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. What? Now, I I want you to understand the depth of of how they might be frustrated with that statement. Because I only read us the part where it says that they traded natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. But Paul added more verbiage after 28. And he says... Those who are filled with worthless thoughts arrive at this devastating destination of one of these, one from this list, or multiple from this list. Listen to this list of where the worthless mind leads us. It leads to unrighteousness, evil, greed, wickedness, envious, murderous, quarrelsome, deceitful, malicious. Those people are awesome. Now buckle yourselves up, y'all, okay? We just need to buckle up and wear our big boy, big girl pants. Gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And even though they know there is an eternal penalty for such a lifestyle, not only do they do these things, but they applaud others who practice the same things. Sin! Yes! Sin! Woo! Do it! Greed! Get your sum! Get yours! Get his! Get mine! Go for it! Lust, what? Yeah, come on, lust some. They applaud it. You're just, you're, you're normal. You're, that's, you're normal. That's what you're, you're supposed to, you're, come on, that's the American way. That's, that's the way this world turns. Get you some. Do it, don't. It's not about humility. It's about knowing who you, be confident. 
confident might even be too soft. You be proud of who you are. There's a difference of taking pride and being prideful. But all of these things, all of these characteristics have an end destination of judgment and destruction. I don't want to be soft today and not talk about sin. I don't want to be one of those preachers that only land. I'm, we're talking about goodness and kindness, y'all, and we're landing on the depravity of humankind. We have to understand the depth of the grossness of humankind for us to fully understand the depth and the, the width of God's goodness and kindness. So Paul lists out all of these attributes, and he says, when, this is pretty much how it would read. Y'all, as I was reading that list, some of y'all had a secondary list of people's names attached to those characteristics. That's called judging. That's messed up. If, if any one of y'all judge, you are condemning yourself because you do the same things. And at that, I see this legalistic religious grandma in my mind. <coughs> what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, ah, how dare you? Do you not know how holy I am? And to that, <laughs> we, we've got to not be that. But I'm not as bad as. That's your first. Let, let's just stop there because anything that we would say after that statement is going to be equally as bad. To ever say, well, I didn't go as far as them, so we're good, <laughs> right? Because your attention is going to be on the one who has done worse things than me. Well, here in a little while, we're going to read in chapter 2 where it says that God does not show partiality. Shoot. Man. And that's why Paul says, any of y'all that judge, you don't have a leg to stand on in this case of you judging other people. You cannot justify yourself. You cannot come up with enough evidence to justify your gossip. Your judgment towards other people because you do the same thing. And this is what Paul's saying. I was going to do this this morning, but I couldn't get my hands on a couple light bulbs. But I was going to break two light bulbs, okay? Two different ways. Imagine this. Just picture this. Use your imaginations. I drop one light bulb and it breaks, right? I don't, unless you're dropping in a trash can. Most of the time when you drop a light bulb on a hard surface, it's going to break. Then I was going to take one and just tap it with a hammer and then present both of them to you and ask you, is there any difference between these two light bulbs? Is there any difference? Would there be any difference between the two bulbs? Why? Because they're both broken. If we ever, if we ever try to slide ourselves into some unique category where our brokenness is at a shallower level than someone else's brokenness, that's being a judge. And Paul says, stop judging. You don't have a foot to stand on because you're broken. It's kind of like he's the Oprah of brokenness and you're broken and you're broken and you're broken. None of us have a right. And this is, this is fully in the context of a conversation between those who know God and those who don't. I do need to draw this distinction, though, that within the realm of the church family, the, the moment we say yes to Jesus and we get discipled a little bit and we start growing in our faith, at that point, we are to hold one another accountable. Accountability 
requires judgment. And I'm not talking about like, "Mm, let me just assess the clothes you're wearing. No, it runs a little bit deeper than that. Where it's like, listen, when that one thing didn't go your way and you cussed somebody out, help me understand how those words honored God. When, let me just talk fictitiously over something that might happen in church. When somebody in pastoral leadership made this decision for this ministry and you didn't like it and you just, not to the pastor's ear, but to somebody who knew that they would buy into what you would say. It's called gossip. Tell me something. How does disunity and discord have anything to do with the unity in the body that Paul talks about in Ephesians? The call within the church is to the, the purpose of the church in view of its purpose for, to the world. He says this, you need to, your aim as the body of Christ is to reveal to the world the presence of God and they're going to see God's presence by your unity. I don't know that a person could maliciously attack the definition of unity any more intentionally or poignantly than gossip. That tells me that individuals need a crash course test on conflict resolution. They need to read through, like if you have a problem with a brother, go talk to them. If they don't hear you, take another brother with you. That's the kind of stuff that we've got to work on. Now, I'm talking about other churches, totally judging other churches right now, not us, because we don't have that problem. We're all in the same boat, y'all. Broke is broke, and we all broke. We're broke in some shape or another, some form or another. We're we're broken people. And if we ever, yes, we are saved by faith. It's by grace that we've been saved by or through faith in Christ. Yes. But as long as we are breathing on this planet, we have this war that's waging where we're still man. We're still humankind. And we're still prone to sin if we live unguarded. And if we ever think that we've arrived, and this, this is what holiness and righteousness looks like, not you. If, if we'd start doing that, I'm a really, like, real quick, first of all, want to respond in a non-pastoral kind of way, but then it's like, I'm just not interested in being a church like that. So either peace out and find another place to do that, or, or allow yourself to go through a process where you get that discipled out of you. That's the church. We're still in kindness, by the way. Just let me remind you. But to fully understand With everything that I just spelled out, please hear me. This isn't even one of the verses, but, oh my gosh, while, while we were still sinners, God sent his son. While we were still sinners, that is a monstrous act, I can't even come up with the right word. It's such a monumental display of kindness that while we were still sinners, Jesus not only was sent, but he died on the cross. Are we doing good? (laughs) You're like, well, kind of. I mean, I realize my brokenness right now. So what Paul does in Romans 1 is he sets the stage for God's kindness to be seen. We're going to spend the next chunk of time getting into the depth of his kindness. 
Verse 1, for when you judge one another, you condemn yourself since you, the judge, do the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on truth. It's not based on anything else. God, God's ways are based upon truth, not some hidden motive or hidden agenda. Do you really think, do you really think, I mean, I'm talking about any of you who judge those who do such things yet do the same thing. Do you really think that you'll ex- escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? That's such a strong way of wording God's kindness. There's so many contrasts going on here. You have the word despised and kindness in the same sentence. But when, listen, church, when a person judges somebody's lifestyle who doesn't know God, that individual has just stepped into the realm of despising God's kindness. One of my favorite statements to make uh, with, with individuals who, um, I've talked with some, some parents who, who are just concerned for their children, making right decisions and all this kind of stuff, and, and we've been in ministry long enough to, to have seen this play out by now, where, where I'll just tell a mom or dad, I'm like, listen, I know that your child is, is making some really uh, just frustrating choices right now, but you, we need to understand, you need to understand, or I just, I, I encourage you to understand the fact that every single one of us has a unique path that we're walking out. And you're frustrated with their decisions and maybe even heartbroken over their decisions. And you see, you see where it's leading. But they need to have a revelation from God on this path. And, and your words, you, you pray. And when there's this invitation for your voice, then speak it graciously speak the truth with love but we've all got our path that we walk down and that path is a demonstration a real-time demonstration of God's kindness now let's walk through these words here because he says do you despise do you despise his kindness. Do you despise the riches of his kindness? And so despise literally means to make light of, to treat as if it is insignificant, to think little of. Do you think little of God's abundance? Do you think little in empty thoughts towards God's fullness of his kindness. This challenges us on every level because it's not hard for us to see individuals who are making decisions for their life that are going to lead lead them to destruction. It's going to lead them to heartache and heartbroken, maybe even damage to their bodies. I mean, we we can see these things play out. We're not called to judge. We're called to move in the same way that God moves, and He moves out of the riches of His kindness. Now, kindness, I I think we know what that word means, but, but just so that we're on the same page, kindness in this context is goodness and gentleness. Those who are living a life that clearly doesn't honor God, and by the way, they, they're either living that way because of some moment or f- some situation um, in, in early on in life, or, I mean, the, 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 the potential of diverse stories is endless, okay? Everybody ends on a path, ends up on a path that's tailor-made to them by, based upon their life experiences, What we are called to do and how we are called to live is operate in the same way that God has just an abundant amount of kindness. We need to operate out of that kindness, that goodness, and that gentleness. What does gentleness look like? 
Gentleness looks like this, where you're willing to hear their story before you're willing to tell them the truth you think they need to hear. That's gentleness. Go through and, and read through Jesus' interactions with people. There's some times where he spoke boldly, he, he, he knew what people were thinking and he spoke directly to it, but then those who, I just think about the woman at the well. He didn't just come down on her and just like, bam, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. He asked for water and he spoke with her. Blew her mind that a Jew would be talking to a Gentile. or even that a man would be talking to a woman. He broke all social standards so that he could display kindness. Man, what a statement. What if Grow Church was comprised of a body of believers that broke social standards so that they could demonstrate the kindness of God. I don't know, I'd say amen to that one, but that's cool. Kindness is the expression or the display of goodness. Kindness is goodness in action. And then some of y'all's translations might use the word tolerance. I'm thankful that they translated this, this uh, Christian standard Bible is, uh, they use the word restraint. The, the imagery that comes into my, my mind, first of all, restraint is, is holding back or delaying, stopping hostilities. Some people might not like the word tolerance or restraint because if, if God is restraint towards those who are destined for destruction, doesn't that kind of give the impression that he approves of their behavior? No. God gives room for humankind to throw their tantrums and try their course in life. He gives room for it. Sadly, there's many within the church that don't give people that same room. Way quicker to, to make judgmental statements. That's a sin. That's gross. You're broken. You're busted. I see that speck, and I see that speck. I see that speck. I'm ignoring the plank, but I see that speck. So restraint is essentially this. It's God's girdle that is temporarily holding in his wrath. So just think of God's wrath being like cased sausage. <laughs> and eventually, it's going to bust open, right? God's restraint is not God's approval. It is not his affirmation. It is his kindness on display. It is not him letting you get away with anything. I don't know if you've ever seen a child with, um, with no parameters, a child that's being raised with no parameters, it's like, okay, well, we're just going to wait and watch this one unfold. See how this one works out. But they're going to they're hit the road, hit the life of hard knocks, and they're going to learn a thing or two. God gives us room to bump through life to learn who he is. And what the church needs to be are the bumpers. Not the arrows and the spears when they run into it. It's like, ah, oh, that hurt. I hate running into the church because all I experience is pain. 
And how many people continue to strive to live in the middle of this broken lane because they don't want to bump into this church or that church or, or that, that, that scripture just because it just, you are causing more hurt than comfort. And y'all, I'm just standing up here making it sound as simple as bumpers on a bowling alley. But this conversation is every day a challenging one because what does comfort look like? Am I supposed to speak the word? Am I supposed to invite the church? Am I supposed to smile? Am I supposed to speak strong or not? Am I, uh, how am I supposed to embrace but not approve and, and, and say, yes, this is good? And yeah, go for that, that um, transition in your life. Go for that physical transition, I, knowing that it's, how, how do we do this? It's not, it's not a straight line. But what we can't be are people that are just like tweaked out. You know, you feel the the tightening in your neck when you see others live in a way that that doesn't agree with you. I call that being spiritually OCD, where you are so quickly able to point out the flaws in other people and not give them the grace to let God work that out. That's called being spiritually OCD. Let me give you a couple of examples. I meant to share this a little bit sooner, but I want to share some pictures with you. I just want to see what these pictures do to some of y'all that might be OCD in a different way. So here's the first one. Some of you are already like, no, I know where we're going. Stop. Stop this. If you look at broken people like you look at that, you will have no voice in their life. You just need to, yep, that did not happen right. (laughs) Let's go to the next one. Closet door coordinated, closet color coordinated, food pantry alphabetized, shoelaces, same length, last box left unchecked. Some of y'all, that may not do anything to you. There's probably one person in here that's like, "Ah, (laughs) give me a green marker. Let's go to the last one. (laughs) <laughs> really a line there's the line and we can't even cross it because it's not straight <laughs> but here's the thing with any of those pictures whether it's the check box that, yeah you got you 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 came to church but you you cut you cussed so i'm gonna uncheck that box i'm not giving permission to profanity I'm just saying we need to give people room. If you're tweaked out by an offset in front of you, then you're probably going to desire to live like a monk because you're going to see offset lines and people all over the place. Let me make a statement that's really clear, though. Within the church, with one another, please, if you see me acting arrogant or saying anything arrogant, or saying anything, oh, I say flippant things all the time, so maybe I shouldn't say that one, but, um, but like if something is inconsistent with the word, we should invite one another as the body of Christ, please speak to my broken lines, because I want to be lined up in Christ, but you, we, we can't do that in, in our community, those who are living a different lifestyle. Let me, let me just share with you how broken and messed up you are. We'll never get you anywhere. And I think that we know this, but I wonder if we've allowed people to speak into the subtle vibes that we give off, where we, may, we might not speak judgment, we may not speak gossip, but some people don't even need to say anything to be broken or to be judgmental. Because I don't know if you have that close friend that you can just look at each other and be like, mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Where, where in an unhealthy way, you notice somebody that has upset one of the two of you and you see that person, the person's over there and then you look at your, per, your person and you're like, And 
It's, that's no different. Because while this person is seeing you bob your head to your person, they're like, well, that just, they didn't even need to say anything. They just affirmed what I was feeling in my spirit. Didn't even need to say anything. Today was the day that I was going to just share with them, unpack with them. I was going to apologize for the way that I was behaving and explain to them that my life is falling apart. You know, they, they were a safe place, but because they can't get past themselves, I have nowhere to go. And yeah, I mean, we can be hypersensitive about this, but y'all, there's a lot of broken people in our world today, and we can't afford to do this. We got to grow up. We got to be intentionally present. We got to be in the Word. We got to have goodness and kindness flowing out of our lives. And the contrast here, and I just want to end on this. Last week, God's goodness is being stored up for those who fear Him. Contrarywise, God's wrath is being stored up for those who walk in judgment. Real time, right now, there is a storehouse being built up, two different storehouses being built up. One is loaded with God's goodness. The other is loaded with God's wrath. Which one do you want to be saved up for you? Which one do you want to be poured out over your life? Because if we, th- if we read these words flippantly, back, hey, okay, really, is there really a storehouse? Re- really? Yes, there is. Because if we talk ourselves out of it, then we're saying the Bible's lying to us, and it's not. Real time, our actions for those who know better Our lives are being weighed out in the presence of God. And this is not a fear message, but a compelling to live a life that we're called to live kind of message. We cannot make light of God's kindness. His kindness serves the hopeful purpose of bringing people to a place of repentance. So yeah, God's kindness has an agenda to it, but it's not messed up like our version of agenda. His agenda is, is all wrapped up in people's hearts coming to Him. Why don't we get on that page with God where His kindness and His, His goodness is flowing out of us so that people have a chance to see God represented and it draws them to Him. Amen? Amen? So, a little long today, kind of par for the course lately. Grab your connection card. I really do encourage you, if you've never done this, please, please, please don't neglect this moment here where we are processing the message and, and writing these thoughts down. But here's the question. How have you made light of God's kindness toward others? Think about your glances. Think about your words. Think about the places that you go, your demeanor, all of these different things. Think about somebody who has said yes to Jesus, who is severely broken, and rather than celebrating, you looked in skepticism because, okay, is this really going to last? That's called judging. That's called making light of God's kindness in someone else's life.